Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's graph reading group. Where we have Benjamin presenting his paper about differential physics combined with diffusion models. Um, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> welcome to my presentation um, about our recent paper, score matching by differential physics. Um, so, first off, um, hi, um, my name is Benjamin. Um, I work, uh, I'm a PhD student at TU, TU Munich. Um, in the physics-based simulation group. So we do a lot of um, research on combining simulations and AI um, to kind of make simulations better or faster um, or more accurate. Um, I'm also um, co-supervised by Simona Vigetti. So one of my supervisors is Niels Thierry at UM. And my other supervisor is Simona Vigetti at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, um, where we try to solve um, inverse problems um, with the help of um, AI and at the moment with <laughs> score-based methods. Um, basically, those inverse problems um, are related to finding dark matter um, and to the phenomenon, phenomenon of um, strong gravitational lensing. This is just as um, a context, so this is not really relevant for this paper, just, just as information on what I currently also work on a lot. Um, and maybe um, as a disclaimer for this talk, so um, I'm aware that the topic of this um, group is a learning on graphs and geometry. So this paper um, that I'm going to present, so we didn't have a specific focus on graphs and geometry. So we kind of worked, um, our experiments were just on normal grids with the standard CNN architectures that are also used in computer vision. Um, but I do believe that can actually um, generalize and transfer a lot of the methods um, to work with graph neural networks. Um, yeah, but we can maybe discuss this uh, at the end. Um, okay, so I would um, begin with um, a toy example which illustrates score matching and the reverse diffusion theorem quite nicely. Um, and for this toy example, um, we kind of consider um, so-called stochastic differential equation. You can see the stochastic differential equation here. So you have this dx equals, and then you have a term called the drift and a term um, for the diffusion. So the idea is that if you just ignore the diffusion, you would have um, something that resembles an ODE with all the theory um, that we already know about ODEs. And you can also um, solve it like an ODE if you ignore the diffusion. Um, but now if you include this diffusion, you can kind of think of it as adding an infinitesimally small Gaussian random, Gaussian random variable um, at every kind of point in time. Um, and this is kind of scaled by this diffusion coefficient, this GT. Um, so in, in this example, we have a very specific um, drift, which is given as minus sine of x um, times x squared. And then we have a constant diffusion. And so now if you um, try to solve this stochastic differential equation. So in, instead of solving it, we kind of can simulate different paths um, from it, um, which are different every time based on this random diffusion term. Um, and so basically what you um, obtain if you solve it is something that looks like those data trajectories here. So you have different paths, but what's also important here is that we kind of need to say what are our initial boundary conditions. So we kind of start at time zero and, and then we say that um, we just have two options. We have here in this toy example, we have sort of a categorical distribution where we start in either minus one or one. And then we simulate this stochastic differential equation, which gives us uh, different um, paths um, that um, all kind of come close to zero when time increases. Uh, and now what um, we can do now, what we can look at, which is quite an interesting mathematical object, is this um, so-called score. Um, the idea here is that those data trajectories and this data set, it kind of implicitly defines marginal likelihoods for your data at different time steps, different values of t. And the score just tells you what is the gradient of that log data likelihood. 
so this gradient log ptx. Um, and we have um, visualized this now below the data trajectories. And this is actually already an approximation that um, was learned by a neural network using our method. So um, this is actually already um, kind of plotted from um, what the neural network has learned. And um, to have a nicer picture, we basically truncated the color map so that you see the more important regions a bit better. Um, but so how, how I interpret it um, is in the following way. So the idea is that um, if you have a bigger T, you see that those um, trajectories are all close to zero. You kind of have a maximum, a, a global maximum for the density of your um, data distribution there um, around zero when your T is a bit larger. Um, and now if you look at the score, the score is around zero, is approximately zero around x equals zero, um, which tells you basically, okay, there is like a global optimum, minimum, or maximum for the data distribution. Um, now, if you are a bit, like if, if you go up a little bit into this blue um, region, into this blue area, your score turns negative. And this kind of tells you, okay, um, if you move now downwards towards zero, this will kind of increase your data likelihood. And the same is true when you are at zero and you go um, downwards in this red region, then the score will turn positive and will tell you, okay, if you move upwards, this will kind of increase your data likelihood. And now what I think is a very cool theorem um, is that you can use this score in a very clever and specific way um, to define so-called reverse SDE, um, which is mathematically given by this expression here on the right. And you can use this reverse time SDE to sample from your data distribution at capital T. Then you can kind of simulate this reverse time SDE, which includes this score. And um, when you simulate it from capital T to T equals zero, you kind of end up with, um, again, with uh, paths either ending in minus one or one. So you kind of get the correct distribution um, that you use to create your data. Um, and this is basically what's happening under the hood of all those diffusion models. Um, so the idea there is quite similar that you have something like an SDE, you have a data distribution, which is like your image, natural image distribution. You have an SDE, an SDE that adds um, noise to it. And slowly all those paths will kind of resemble if you increase T and then you look at capital T, they will look like Gaussian normal distributions like white noise basically. Um, and then you can kind of use this reverse time SDE to kind of start at the white noise at this Gaussian random distribution at this noise distribution, simulate your reverse time SDE and get back something from your data distribution. Um, so that's also what we're using here. Um, and then there is um, another nice um, equation, which is now an ODE, which is this probability flow ODE um, that you see below that. Um, and what's interesting about this is that this is now deterministic. So it's not, um, not um, there, there's no randomness in it, but you basically, when it comes to the marginal likelihoods of your data, it has the same marginal likelihoods as the reverse time SDE. That means you can basically do the same thing. You can also sample from your data distribution at capital T, simulate this probability flow ODE, and you will also get data that is distributed like your initial data distribution, your, um, as a, I mean, paths ending in minus one or either one. Um, and so this is uh, quite, quite really an intriguing result, I think. Um, which is very useful um, for science and AI, I, I believe, because it, lets, it allows us to gain a lot of insights in what those neural networks are actually approximating um, when, they, when they learn something. Um, so um, there is another thing I um, wanted to discuss at the beginning of the talk. Um, this is a topic that also 
my group at TOM is working a lot on, um, and this is um, learned corrections for physical simulations. So the idea here is that you try to solve a, a simulation um, using like a recursive iteration rule where you have um, a simulation state xi plus one, which um, is defined basically. Uh, so you have a PDE solver that uh, simulates your simulation forward in time. So you give it um, the state xi, and it simulates it forward in time by delta t. Um, and and um, you kind of use this to define your xi plus one. However, you also include this um, learned correction. So this learned correction is a neural network that is trained to um, optimize a specific task. Um, and so where this might be useful is um, the following. So you have a simulation that was, for example, simulated on a very high resolution and it's very expensive to run. Um, but you do this a few times and you get like a, a data set of simulation trajectories that are very accurate. Um, and now what you want to do is you want to run the same simulation, but you want to make it less computationally expensive. So you use something like a um, lower resolution, a Corsair grid. Um, but now what happens? So, so the blue line here you see on the picture is basically you your reference trajectory, your ground truth solution. Um, you kind of downsample it. Um, and then you have a simulation on a lower resolution. And this um, is now this light brown line. And you see that because of the coarser grid, lower resolution, you have things like inaccuracies or you have numerical errors because of that. And as a result, this new simulation will um, diverge from the reference. Um, and the idea now is to have a neural network um, which kind of corrects the simulation at every time step, which corrects the numerical errors so that um, your simulation on the course grid now gives you the correct results that match the simulation that was um, run on a high resolution grid. Um, and so you can basically see it here on the right where you have your um, blue reference trajectories, then you have the green corrections by the neural network, uh, which kind of push the simulation um, towards the reference. And um, an example of this is the following. So you um, have here a simulation in A um, that was run on a course resolution. Um, then you have the simulation with a learned correction, and then you have the reference simulation um, on which you kind of trained, the, of which you used to learn the correction. And um, you can see here that this already works quite well. So this is a good method to um, do things like correct inaccuracies or numerical errors, and it has quite good results in, in general. Um, however, and this was kind of my starting point for this paper, um, this learned correction is a lot like a black box. So you don't really know what it does. Um, oh, I, th I see you have a question. Um, yeah. Yeah, hello, Benjamin. Um, can you explain briefly what would be the advantages of learning the correction versus learning the uh, dynamics directly, le learning the PDE? So you mean um, that you have a neural network that learns everything and you don't have a solver there, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, so you, you can do this, um, and in some cases, so as neural networks get bigger and, and our training comes better and we have more data, um, this will kind of also work very well. Um, but very often you don't have enough data so that you can um, just rely only on a neural network to do simulation. And in many examples, so um, your neural network very often doesn't generalize very well to new simulations, to new boundary conditions and all that sort of stuff. And just empirically, um, what I've seen is that when you learn it, when you learn everything, then it will have problems generalizing to new kind of data domains, to new kind of boundary conditions. And when you include this PDE solver in there, like the, the physics that you already know, um, then it is much, much more robust to those sort of effects. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, thank you. That answers the question. Um, you're welcome. Yeah, so um, I was just um, saying that basically those learned corrections are, yeah, basically a, a black box. And it would be very nice if we could relate them to something like the score. Um, and then also another question is how can we deal with uncertainty and randomness in our reference solutions? Um, so for example, when we just don't have enough information to know what will be um, the correct solution. Um, and then what I found quite interesting is can you do something similar as all those diffusion models for generative modeling are doing at the moment? Can you actually solve an inverse problem by running a simulation backwards in time? Um, and um, so to kind of answer all of those questions, what we did is we kind of tried to set up physical problems in the form of an SDE, where we have a neural network that um, is trained to approximate um, this, this score function and then kind of use similar techniques as, um, as those diffusion models do, but now with um, a different kind of drift, a drift that is given by a PDE solver. Um, and, and yeah, we, we see how, how that works. And um, also what um, I believe is also a, a big key difference to all of those diffusion models is that um, we don't really want a very big diffusion term. So um, what, what we do is that we typically set the diffusion term very small so that we don't really destroy a lot of information in the simulation, but it rather acts like a small perturbation of the simulation state. So it's not meant to destroy all of the information. It should kind of maintain as much information as possible. Um, and then we can, for example, implement this physics drift in our SDE formulation um, like this, where we have a PDE solver um, that kind of defines the dynamics of the system. And um, we also made some experiments that kind of show that you can also use a neural network that is kind of learned to represent this physics. Um, so, okay. And then we kind of want to use methods like this probability flow ODE or the reverse time SDE to run simulation backwards in time to solve inverse problems. Um, so okay. next I would, yeah. Okay, no, uh, that's exactly what I wanted to say now because right, you now no, no longer can sample your forwards um, trajectory in closed form, and then uh, training should become a little bit harder. So how do you? Yeah, I, I also think that training is a bit harder in, in this case, but um, it still works and, and kind of that's the best that you can do in this general setup. Of course, when you have um, so so typically in, in those diffusion models, this drift is a very nice equation or a very nice term you can work out a lot of things analytically in a closed form but when you have like a general pde solver <laughs> um it doesn't work anymore maybe there are special cases where you can find some things that are can compute more efficiently but in general i think it's, it's much more harder and, and like impossible in many cases um yeah, so the question is, how do you train your score network in this case? Um, and we actually found that there are different methods how to do it. And, and we, in, in the paper, we also um, evaluate different methods how to do it um, and also different inference methods. Um, but I think it would be too much to talk about all of them now, all the things that you can do. But um, I believe that there's one method that we used a lot, which um, is nicely motivated, um, which is quite novel, um, which which I want, which which is also basically very similar to the other methods, but there are subtle differences basically. Um, and and this method works um, as follows. Um, so, the training of this score network is based a lot on this probability flow ODE, um, and so the idea is that you replace the the score in this probability flow ODE by your neural network as a theta. And you also assume that you have your data trajectory. So you have some kind of ground truth data that, for example, um, shows the simulations at um, fixed time steps, T1, T2, and so on. So there's some sort of um, uniform time discretization. Um, 
or your training data. Um, and so that then what we do is we use an ODE solver um, to compute the solutions of this probability flow ODE. Um, and so we have this term mu tj x ti, um, which occurs, occurs quite often. Um, and this basically just um, tells you that this is um, the stands for the solution of this probability flow ODE at a time tj, given like a simulation state at time um, ti. So you can imagine that you can just solve this probability flow ODE with an ODE solver, um, given um, a specific simulation state at a specific time. Um, and you can also solve it forwards or backwards at time. So this is also important. So this ti doesn't need to be smaller or bigger than tj. So you can solve it forward and backward in time. Um, and then what we kind of worked out um, is that you can, um, so we, we have, and, and this is important, we have two different loss terms. One is this single step loss and one is this multi-step loss. And the idea is that um, for the single step loss, you just consider two different single steps from one time point to the other. You can write down a single step loss. Um, so you kind of sample three points, x t i minus one, x t i, x t i plus one, which are um, adjacent on a training trajectory. Um, and then you can calculate the sum of this, those two L2 terms, um, this x t i minus x t i plus one minus mu t i plus one x t i. And then you have this other um, term x t i minus one minus mu t i minus one x t i. Um, and basically what you try to do here is you try to um, fit your probability. So a small, small part, small part of your probability flow um, ODE of the trajectory that you get from the probability flow ODE, you try to fit it towards all kinds of different SDE paths. Um, based based on always picking those three adjacent samples. And what you can do is that you can show that approximately this minimizes the score matching objective, um, which, which you can see um, down below here. Um, and so this is the single step loss. Um, but what we found out is that um, in, in our case where you include the physics operator, it's important to also consider a multi-step loss um, where you not only consider three time points, but the idea is that you consider longer sequences of points now. So you consider a longer trajectory and not just three, three points, but um, apart from now considering more points and, and considering this bigger sum, it is actually um, very similar to the single step loss. Um, and in, in this case, there's also a nice interpretation of what happens now when you not consider those three points. And always, um, I think I didn't mention it specifically here, but you also have to assume that the time steps between different points on the trajectory is small. So you kind of have to assume that this delta t, which is the difference in time between different time steps, is, is quite small. So you can't do it when, when there's like a big gap. Um, but um, in this in this case, that this delta t is small. Um, you have this equivalency to score matching objective for the single step loss and for the multi step loss. You can interpret it as maximizing a variational lower bound for maximum likelihood training. So um, I don't want to get too deep into the mathematics behind this, but the idea here is basically that um, you have your probability flow ODE, and you can imagine that you can sample um, the um, points at your initial distribution and then simulate all of them forward with your probability flow ODE. And then this will give you a distribution that is now induced by this probability flow ODE at a light, later point in time. And you kind of try to minimize the KL divergence between this distribution and the actual data distribution. And instead of minimizing this KL divergence, you can also look at it as a sort of maximum likelihood training. And in that sense, it kind of maximizes the variational lower bound of that. Um, OK. Um, but uh, for the moment, uh, we, we can maybe discuss this in a bit more detail later. 
um, for the moment, I would um, go on with um, this sliding window method, which we use to train our networks. Um, so the idea is that for the multi-step loss and for the um, single step loss, you always have to pick different time points that are adjacent to each other. And the way we do it is that we kind of consider just a data trajectory um, here, x1, x2, x3, and we always begin our training with the single step loss. And then we pick three adjacent points um, and compute a single step loss based on them. And then we move this um, sliding window um, by one and, and do this again and kind of repeat this until we have covered the entire trajectory. Um, however, um, we noticed that kind of this is not sufficient for training. So we, we get much better results when we gradually increase the sliding window size. So instead of um, having this window size of two, we, um, after training for a few epochs um, with this smaller window size, we gradually start to increase it. Um, and we consider a bigger window size of three, and we, then we don't have the single step loss anymore, but this multi-step loss. Um, but we can basically do the same thing here again. Um, and um, yeah, so that so so we kind of increase the window size until a fixed maximum size, at which at some point we stop training. Um, okay. So. So far, are there are there any questions? Okay. I um, guess we are all set. And, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I hope that wasn't too much. Um, so um, let's start with the first experiment um, with heat diffusion, which is quite a nice. Um, nice um, experiment because it um, when when you include the noise when you model it as an SDE because of the diffusive behavior of this heat equation it actually doesn't play a very central a big role with because when you include rock noise and um, by the dynamics of the heat equation and um, the noise kind of gets averaged out and, and because of the dynamics because it diffuses um, it, it you don't really see much difference, um, but you can still model it with the noise included and model it as an SDE. Um, so the, the heat equation is given by this um, equation here, by this PDE. Um, and in our case, we just set this alpha here to one, the diffusivity, and we considered Gaussian random fields as initial conditions. Um, we have a, a, a few um, ground truth simulations I think we had around 2,500, um, which were simulated with Euler steps um, with, um, I think, I believe 32 steps from t equals 0 to t equals 0 0.2. Um, and so we, we trained our networks with this uh, multi-step. So we started with the single step loss, then we used the sliding window method and gradually increased the window size. Um, and so here, I wanted to show you some of the results. Um, Basically, we try to recover the ground truth state at t equals zero, which looks like this. Um, and now if we only look at the physics, so we can completely ignore the neural network and try to invert the physics just with the physics operator and, and the solver, um, it will not work very well. So the reason for that is that because you have um, small noise that, that is added, even though the noise is very small, um, because in one direction, the physics smoothes the noise. That means that in the other direction, this noise will kind of be amplified quite a lot. And this is the reason why um, when you only look at the physics solution, it explodes like this. Um, and then we train our score network and, and look at simulations or the solutions from the probability flow. Um, and you can see what's quite interesting is that you get Kind of very smooth solutions always um, and um, so i believe this is something that just always happens with the probability flow that you get um quite quite smooth things out of it um but yeah that's i think just what happens in this case however when you now look at this um 
not, not at the probability flow, but at the actual reverse time SDE, um, what you see is that you actually get um, solutions, that are, solutions that are now not smooth anymore. So um, they actually quite nicely match the um, correct um, the correct solution. Um, and when you kind of analyze this uh, more quantitatively, um, then you see that um, there are basically two directions that you can go. Um, for now, I would kind of ignore the baseline methods. Um, so I don't think they are very important for our discussion. Um, so we have kind of two, two metrics here, this MSE, which tells us, um, okay, we have a solution from this method now, from the probability flow, which is here abbreviated SMDP ODE, and we have a solution by the SMDP SDE. Um, what happens when we now simulate the system forward in time again? Do we get out what we initially started with? Um, and so the MSE is just the L2 uh, distance to the uh, to our to what the network was conditioned on to the end state basically. So we have the end state. We want to find the initial state, the ground truth to that, and then we simulate it um, in the other like forwards in time again and compared to that. So this is what MSE does. And we also have um, the spectral error, which kind of tells you if um, the, um, the spectral error looks kind of at the spectral density and compares that to the ground truth spectral density, density that you would expect from your Gaussian random fields. And, and those are kind of um, things that you would want from your solution to have a, to, to look like Gaussian random fields and to um, reproduce that very well. Um, and, and it basically tells you if the solutions that you get from this method, if the power on specific scales is correct. Um, and you can see that here on the right, where you have your data as a red line, and then you have the different uh, methods. And what you see is basically that SMDP SDE does by far the best. So it kind of reproduces um, all the different scales quite nicely, whereas the ODE um, kind of drops off very early. So ODE, is, so SMDP ODE is this uh, green line, it drops off, off very early, and that tells you that generally the solutions that you get from there are a bit too smooth. And so you kind of have, um, with the same network weights, you have an inference method um, with SMDP ODE, which gets you very accurate solutions in terms of the MSE, but which are often a bit too smooth. And then on the other hand, you have um, the SDE method, which gives you very good looking results um, with a low spectral error, but which have a bit higher MSE reconstruction error. So you have kind of two sides there. Um, yeah, but if you compare it to the baseline methods, basically, for each metric, either the MSE or the spectral error, um, either the SMDP ODE or SMDP SDE perform best. Um, so that's quite nice to see. Um, and also kind of to illustrate um, how diverse the different solutions by the SDE are, um, we looked at um, the 1D case where we can visualize things um, a bit nicer. So we have here the um, simulation end states of the heat equation. So we have like a reference simulation end state um, for which we want to find the initial states. And we have this, we, we kind of add a little bit of noise, but it's just really very small. So you don't even see it in the picture. Um, and then we kind of look at what would be the ground truth for that, ground truth simulation state at the beginning at t equals zero, and look at the different solutions of the reverse time SDE. And you kind of see that they are very diverse and they kind of match, match the ground truth quite well, I would say. And then you can, uh, again, simulate it forward in time. So this would be necessary if you calculate this reconstruction MSE. Um, but you can see that basically visually you cannot tell any difference between the different solutions by the reverse time SDE now. So they, they are very accurate. Um, even though they are a bit worse than this SMS, even though they are worse in terms of reconstruction MSE than the probability flow ODE, like visually you can't 
can't really tell the difference. Um, okay. So um, one thing that's important, and I, I basically always said that you need this multi-step multi loss to get good results. Um, so what we did here was kind of a, doing an ablation study for the sliding window method. Um, and the idea was um, here that what if we just use, um, so, so what happens when we kind of change the maximum sliding window size? So if we have a sliding window size, which is this rollout length on the x-axis here, um, when we have one of two, we just train with the single step loss. Um, and then when we, we, we kind of, um, with four, we kind of train with the multiple st step, multi-step loss with a sliding window size of four, and then with eight, 16, and 32 then at the end. And for the probability flow, um, we were looking at this reconstruction MSE as a metric now, we see that increasing the sliding window size at the end of training, um, we see that this does a bit better, but it's not really substantial. Um, but it's still still like a considerable, a, a significant improvement. Um, however, when you, so, so this is for the probability flow, when you look at the reverse time SDE, you see that it's quite important, um, at least with how much training we do and how much data we have, um, to, to have like larger sliding window sizes at the end of training. So there, really, the improvements are quite significant. Um, and so the reason for that is exactly um, that the physics sometimes in some situations can be quite chaotic. And for normal diffusion models, you kind of have easy drifts, for example. And there it doesn't, like it's not chaotic, chaotic it's a very easy drift and it doesn't play a big role. but in our case, um, what, what we kind of want is that um, the network kind of sees the effects of its output. So when you train and you only consider single steps and during inference, you sometimes have you know, 100 different steps and, and you always have this, um, this network input. Um, we want to include the network physics feedback in, in the training. Um, and this is important because otherwise it might happen that for inference, the trajectory kind of deviates from the ground truth solution domain. And once that happens, it could be that the physics get very chaotic and the network cannot fix this anymore because it had, had never seen really the, the sort of inputs that are now fed into it during training. And by including this multi-step loss, um, we are exactly doing that during training. Um, so the robot, uh, the, the network gets a lot more robust. Um, okay. So that, that's why we kind of have this multi, multi step loss and why it's so important. Um, then, so let me just check the time. Okay, I will try to hurry up a bit. Um, what I think is a quite nice result is that when you look at the SDEs that we have. Um, looked at so far, and we kind of discretize it similar to the Euler steps for ODEs. You can think of it also in a recursive way, where you have a simulation state xi, you add the noise to it, you apply the physics, and you get an xi plus one, um, which kind of directly depends on the noise. Um, and also, I will just write this down here. Um, if you look um, at the Euler steps for the reverse simulation, when you kind of discretize this reverse time SDE, it, you can write it down like this. Um, and so basically by our loss terms and then our theory, um, you kind of learn the correct score based on this reverse diffusion ther theorem. And simulating paths from this reverse time SDE will give you the correct posterior distribution. So in many cases, you cannot, or you, you cannot model your um, physics as an SDE, but what you could do instead is you kind of model it as an ODE where you have your XI, you have your physics um, that gives you the next state at XI plus one and so on. And you now just say, okay, the noise doesn't directly influence um, the system, but when you kind of do measurements, for example, there's always a bit of noise, but this noise doesn't really add into the, the physics, into the system itself. 
Um, and what you can kind of think of is to do um, to do something similar. Um, so you kind of just need to slightly adapt our training and our method um, that, so that for, and, and this is basically very similar to diffusion models, you have your Euler steps for this reverse simulation and you write it down as a physics step, kind of add a little bit of noise and you do a denoising step. And that gives you basically the transition from one time step to the other. Um, and now you could kind of very easily match the terms on the right to the terms on the left. Um, and you will see that they are just um, like the, the order of those terms is slightly changed, um, but those are still the same terms. And you can kind of show that with those terms, and if you kind of train your neural network now changing those steps to this physics steps, this add noise step and this denoising step, you still learn um, the score with a, a bit of a different justification. So you kind of need to use different arguments, um, but you still learn the score. Um, but in this case, you now have no theoretical guarantees regarding the reverse time SDE and the correct posterior, um, but you still have the same score. So I think that's quite an interesting result um, that you can kind of use basically the same method for training, slightly modified for a non-deterministic SDE and a deterministic system where your measurements just have the noise in them. Um, and that's actually now what we're looking at. So we are now looking not any, we're now looking at not any more uh, SDE, but an ODE, uh, and a, a bit more complicated, difficult example um, where we have a, a buoyancy driven flow with obstacles. So we have a simulation that is now much more complicated. We use a, an actual differential simulator, FiFlow, which is also developed by our group for that. Um, and I will just kind of show you the, the videos for how kind of the simulations look. You have a fixed inflow um, down at the bottom there for some time. And um, what's important is you have this marker field and you have velocities. Um, so the velocity in the x direction, you also have um, a velocity in the y direction. Um, but what makes this problem really difficult is that you have those randomly placed obstacles. So those are different every time. Um, and, and this makes, makes it quite hard to kind of reconstruct um, the simulation to run it in reverse because they add a lot of, yeah, they, they make it very difficult, um, those obstacles. Um, okay, but basically we can train um, this uh, neural network to approximate the score in a similar way as the heat equation um, now. And then this is an example actually from the test set. Um, so this is the ground truth, how the reconstruction should look like. And then um, next, I'm gonna show you how it would look like if you only have like the physics and you try to invert the simulator directly, um, but you will see that it does not work very well. Um, so you, you cannot really use this. Um, now we have our solution with the probability flow, um, which does quite well. Um, and then we have the solution with the reverse time SDE. And what you can see now is a little bit of flickering, which is kind of due to the noise that, it, that is added at each step. Um, but you can also see that it produces a very good um, prediction. Um, okay, so maybe um, I think, sorry, I forgot your name. Um, you, you asked the question. Um, someone asked the question at the beginning. Yeah, why do we? Dominic. <laughs> Dominic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> why we actually need the physics simulator. Um, and so, of course, that's an important question. And so, in this case, we wanted to find out if we can actually learn. Um, a neural network like that does this reconstruction, but without the physics simulator. So it, it learns everything by itself. Um, and it really, it, it does quite well. Um, I have to admit that. Um, so here you can see on the top row, you can see the ground truth solution. And then you can see on the second row, you can, um, there is the, um, there's a version fully learned, which is, basically trained with exactly the same setup as um, our score network is trained, but 
now the network has to learn the physics simulator at the same time, so in addition to the score. So it, it has to learn that as well. Um, and then we have um, on the last row, we kind of have the solution with the score and the physics combined. Um, and you can see that it is like the, the fully learned version, it, it does very well, um, but the, the um, version with physics and score does slightly better and it's more accurate. Um, okay, and here you can see some, yeah, um, when you run this reverse time SDE for this kind of problem, you can see the, how the different solutions look like because they will be different every time. And you have a little bit of variation in there. But for this specific problem, we found out that there wasn't too much variation that we get, so just a little bit. Uh, but that kind of is due to the fact that the physics in this case is quite constrained. Um, so you, you do not get a lot of different solutions in this case um, that, that are plausible. So it's it's everything like it, it, it looks similar, um, but still you see a little bit of variation. Okay, um, so then um, as, as the last experiment, um, I, I just want to go over this quite quickly. Um, because this experiment, we kind of just used it to show that we don't actually need to know the physics. You can learn a neural network to represent the physics, and you can learn a neural network to represent a, the score at the same time. So you can, you, you don't need to have like this simulator. Um, and so you kind of have your, your physics network is kind of time independent. So it doesn't, it, it's not conditioned on the time, but the score is kind of conditioned on the time. Um, and then you have on this table, you, again, we have this MSE in a spectral error. We have um, this learned physics, which kind of just tries to um, reconstruct to solve the inverse problem, um, just using one network for the physics. And then we have the SMDP SDE and ODE again, which combine score and physics with the two inference method methods, which one is kind of based on this ODE and the other on the SDE. And you see that um, you basically have the same results as, as for the heat equation. Um, you have a slight decrease in the MSE error for both of them. Um, and then the, uh, but, but the MSE is lowest for the ODE um, version. And for the spectral error, the, MS, uh, the, the error is um, lowest for the SDE version. Um, and then finally, um, what is also quite cool is that now because you have a network um, that kind of represents this score, you can use methods like stochastic, gradient, longitude, and dynamics to kind of refine solutions in sort of a post-processing way. And basically um, with this Langevin dynamics theory, you can kind of define for, for a, a solution or a data point that you have, you can define this update rule and you can kind of iterate it um, where you kind of use the learned network for the score here and um, it will kind of refine your solutions a little bit. So you can see that here um, you have the ground truth, then you have the learned physics, you have the, the ODE solution, you have the SDE solution, and then you kind of, in addition to the SDE solution, you do a few iterations of this, um, of this iteration ruling. You see that you get a bit more details and a bit more structure in there. Um, okay, so that that also works. Um, okay, um, as a summary, um, we can we can learn the score uh, for physical systems modeled by an SDE, and we can use this to run simulations backwards in time. Use and, and solve inverse problems. Um, the single step loss with the sliding window can be used, like theoretically, it minimizes the score matching objective if delta t is small. Um, but for stable inference to get stable trajectories because of those, because we have this complicated chaotic operator, which um, that, that, that we have this complicated physics, um, it is useful um, to. And can kind of adapt this method for deterministic systems um, quite easily with 
this three steps where you have the physics steps, this adding noise and denoising step. And implementation wise, it's very similar to this SDE method um, that, that we had previously for the heat diffusion. Um, and yeah, it, it still learns the correct score, which is quite nice. Um, and then finally, um, you can also learn the physics and score at the same time and represent them with neural networks. And you can use methods like this stochastic gradient, Langevin dynamics for, for small post processing of your solutions. Okay, and well, that would be it. So thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you have some questions. We have to thank you for the nice presentation and explanation. And yeah, I hope indeed that we have some questions. Oh yeah, um, we already have a, a raised hand. Then I would say, let's get to that question. Oh, hi, my name is Francisco. Um, I had a question, um, but I was gonna, I was hoping I could ask it um, on a particular slide on the recon loss and um, um, MLE benchmarking slide, where you had the different models benchmarked against each other. Yeah. Yeah, this one. I was just wondering, could, could you, so I'm looking at the red line at the top, and I'm looking at the two SMDP models, the SMDP ODE and SMDP SDE, right? And yes. so, I was hoping that you could explain the discrepancy in performance between, you know, the SDE to the, or from the ODE to the SDE, and then from the SDE to the red line, sort of with respect to the, the ability to solve the inverse inference problem. I mean, you've kind of talked about yeah, it I, before, I but I was just wondering I, if you could just sort of articulate it here on the slide. I, I think I know what you mean. I, I guess um, the problem with the ODE version is, so it is very accurate. But um, it does not, it is too smooth. So it doesn't create those small scale structures. And part of the reason I think why this is the case is that for the SDE version and every kind of step that you do during inference, you add a little bit of noise. And kind of the network and the physics, what they do with this noise is that they kind of a bit amplify it and then smoothen it down, smooth it down. And so you kind of had a lot more randomness in the SDE solution. You have a lot more noise in there and, and the network kind of in, in combination with the physics uses this noise to create small structures. Um, and so this is why the ODE version is smoother than the SDE version because during inference, you don't have this noise input for the ODE version. And, and this makes the problem of creating small state structure much, much harder. Um, for the SDE um, version, it would be perfect if it would exactly match the red line, um, which it doesn't. Um, I think it does. It, it still does very well, and much better than the comparison methods here. Um, I believe that ultimately, when you kind of train your networks with a lot of data and you train it with the perfect learning rate, and so it will, it will probably get a much, much better, not even even more. Um, I guess one of the problems why it doesn't have the perfect, the perfect kind of distribution, it doesn't perfectly match the data, is that a lot of the structure is created at the very last um, time points, the last time steps, because and maybe when we actually look at, at the simulations again um, and, and pay attention to the, the last moment before it stops the simulation, you will see that for the SDE, most of the structure is created in this last two or three steps. Um, because, okay, now it will show in a moment. But here, no small state structure. And then in the last steps, basically, you have those small state, small scale structure. The reason for that is that the heat equation, the heat diffusion actually very early um, removes this small state structure and it dissipates quite quickly. So you only have very few steps to actually recover it. And I think if you have like a smaller time discretization, this would be less of an issue. Um, and the time discretization in this case is especially important at the beginning of the simulation. So if you would add more steps at that point, I think it would do even much better. So you're saying that the discrepancy in performance is not due to the algorithm itself, it's more due to a data-oriented issue? It, it has more to do with the time discretization that you use. Um, yeah, I, th I think it would get better with a better time discretization, yes. 
of a smaller time discretization. But of course, like you always have the problem, like you don't learn the score perfectly. You always have approximations due to the neural network that you use. So basically in theory, you should, um, if, if you have the perfect score and you have like a very small um, time discretization, you, you should get the perfect result basically regarding the spectral error. But because you, you have neither of those two things, um, you, you don't get like the best, best results. Um, but yeah, still, still, I think it does quite well. At least okay, cool, thank you. Okay, you're, you're welcome. Hello. Uh, thanks, Benjamin, Hi. for the, the great talk. Um, I have uh, a few questions, and I think it's related a bit to, to what's being said here. And, um, and I think it's really cool that uh, you, uh, you build these models to reverse physics. Uh, because like like uh, fluid dynamics is already extremely complicated in itself, or and then trying to reverse that process is even more complex. Uh, and it's nice that uh, to see that it can actually be done. Uh, but the thing here that I'd like to say is that perhaps this is an impossible problem in the fact that entropy increases in every system, and as entropy increases during the stimulation. Uh, you create, um, yeah, so I think a lot, uh, a lot of the initial information can, can be destroyed or many, many system can, um, like if you look at only the ground truth at time equal t, uh, time t equals zero, uh, maybe many, many different initial condition can lead to that exact same step. And yeah, I think this is what you're showing here is that when you do the yeah. forward simulation based on the reverse time SDE, you retrieve almost exactly that same forward simulation. And it simply means that there is an infinitely many number of possibilities that lead to that, um, to that same system. So there is no way to actually retrieve the ground truth. Uh, am I yeah. right on that? Point. No, no, you're perfectly right. I agree with you. Um, you, you. You just lose a lot of information. Um, that's that's true. Also, with this heat diffusion, you kind of just mm -hmm. lose the information of the small scale small scale structures. Um, nonetheless, it's not the case that kind of every solution that just when you simulate it forward in time and gives you the correct thing. Um, is a good solution. There are still solutions that are kind of you know physically implausible. So um, Benjamin, I'm sorry, but uh, we lost the audio on your side. Oh, OK, sorry. Okay, now um, it's uh, back, OK. It's back now, OK, good. Um, what I wanted to say is um, you're perfectly right, but you might still be interested in, in getting one solution at least that kind of matches all the possible plausible physical states that you, yeah, you, you kind of define them implicitly by the data set that you train your score on, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you don't, at the beginning, you don't know what would be like a, a good solution, what would be something that's physically plausible, but you have your data set with all the kind of plausible solutions that you expect to see. And then based on that, the score network kind of tries to combine both those things, give you a plausible solution and give you a solution that kind of fits in the sense that it kind of solves your inverse problem. We have those two, those two different metrics, right? Um, yeah. And so, then, yeah, so, so um, yeah, it's, it's right. That's something that is kind of impossible, to, but you still have like um, some starting point because you can say what is like, like what's a plausible, a good solution? What could it look like? What are the properties that they have? And, and and then based on that, you can actually try to find um, something that, yeah, yeah is, is what you're looking for. But here, I think like, um, and perhaps like this is not the criticism of, of your paper, but perhaps like of um, this entire idea of taking a single time step and retrieving what was there before instead of taking uh, maybe two, three, four snapshots and trying to retrieve what was there before, like what was the initial condition that led to these four snapshots. And the reason I'm saying this is like, 
you were discussing your convolution network where the bigger the window, the better you were able to retrieve what was uh, like, the, the, the better you were actually able to match the physics because you remembered what happened at every step. Um, and you discussed that uh, as being like having less chaos in the system. Uh, but the way that I view it is that perhaps like when you look at a single step, the network can pre predict a delta x in trajectory. For example, if, you, if you're simulating a trajectory, you can predict the delta x. But when you look at two steps, it can also predict it, delta, uh, it, it can infer the delta x and the delta v, and then the delta acceleration as well, um, and so on. And the more you have information about not only position, but position, velocity, acceleration, the derivative of acceleration, uh, the system becomes a lot more predictable. So it's like, instead of having these thousands of solution of quite similar solution that lead to the same forward simulation, because you're looking at many forward simulation, it's very unlikely that uh, many states will lead to the same uh, sequence of snapshots. Because it's not only the snapshot, but also how the snapshot evolves that, that matters. Um, yeah, I, I see that point. I think um, I think that would make the problem a bit more difficult, right? Um, when you have multiple of those, like, it, okay, in some sense, it makes it more easy, but like from our side as programmers, it makes it a bit more difficult, right? Because you have to consider not only one solution, one, one stay, one data point, but you have to consider many of them, right? And so it might be more difficult to model that. Um, well, I mean, you you can simply run the simulation for um, two steps more, and then, um, like, uh, uh, yeah, if if the ground truth was like a sequence of steps, maybe you run the um, the reverse time SDE two two steps more, and like you compute the loss on all steps, uh, like as, as an average of the loss on, on all steps instead. Uh, so. Basically, like, wh what is the motivation of taking a single end state, uh, a single snapshot of the end state, instead of like taking uh, a sequence of snapshot? Um, the motivation was basically that um, it it is, from my perspective, like um, it is closer to the actual way that diffusion models at the moment work, where you also have just one noise that you start with, so it's more similar in, in terms of methodology to what diffusion models do. Um, it is also, I guess, more relevant for the kinds of problems that I work with in astrophysics, where you all kind of look just, you have just one observation, which is like you, the end stage. Um, and so this, you, you don't have anything like intermediate states um, in there that you can use. Um, so I, I guess those are the two points, but I, I agree with you. It would be interesting to see if you could expand it in, in the way you described it. Um, yeah, I guess uh, in astrophysics systems, uh, you would have to wait a million years before getting another snapshot that is relevant. Yeah, yeah, that, maybe, yeah. yeah so this is, uh, this is not possible. Uh, but if we look at fluid dynamics, perhaps it, it would be, uh, it would give nicer solutions to, to have multiple snapshots. Um, like, for mm -hmm. example, if we, uh, if we see a tsunami and we want to reverse like what happened at the origin of the tsunami, right, we can have a film of that tsunami and recover like uh, the, the origin point. Um, yeah, yeah, anyways, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think what, what you did in this work is already great. Like from a single snapshot, retrieving a solution in systems that are chaotic, that have very complex solution. And like, yeah, the fact that, that we can do that is, is uh, already quite impressive. So thanks a lot. Benjamin certainly is very humble about the impacts that his paper or his work might have. But yeah, I definitely think that in like computational biology or fields like that, uh, his work can also be uh, find many nice applications. So maybe you can work on that or can discuss it with us in the next reading group session next week or well, every week. And well, would be nice to see you there.